All right. We are live. Welcome, everybody. Right, we are just going to wait a little bit for a couple more people to uh, start tuning in. All right, as people start to jump in, if you guys want to just uh, say how you found out about the stream today in the chat, that would be awesome. Get an idea for uh, where everyone's coming from. Right. It 
All right, just a little bit longer. Still getting some last second things set up. All right. All right, so we have a couple people here now. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Adam McCulloch. I work at Glass Education. And if you are not very familiar with Glass Education, uh, let me introduce us for a little bit. Uh, so we used to do all of the programs at Yerkes Observatory doing outreach. When Yerkes closed back in October uh, of 2018, we had to move all of our activities off site. And so one of the things that we did when we moved off site was we went and got a portable planetarium and that just happens to be also when I came on board and having had uh, experience running planetariums before, uh, it was a very natural fit for me to start doing shows like that. And now since we don't really want anybody climbing into the planetarium because we don't want to help uh, this COVID-19 spread any more than it already has, we've decided that we want to start being able to do planetarium shows online. And while you might not be able to get kind of the full immersive experience that uh, a portable planetarium would give you, uh, we still have this great tool called Stellarium, which is actually free to download on your computer. And so you can use it at home all you want. And for anybody with a Chromebook or a computer and you're just right up against it memory-wise and you can't afford one more program, there's also a online version of it that's all through your browser. So Stellarium is a great way to look for things in the night sky and find your way around. And I'm going to give everybody now a tour of all of the things that you can do, with, uh, well, some of the things that you can do with Stellarium and kind of a tour of our local night sky here in Wisconsin. So we're just going to jump right in. Uh, if you have any questions, I should also mention this first. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to throw them into the live chat. Uh, all you have to do is make sure you're logged into your YouTube or your Gmail uh, while you're watching this through YouTube and you'll be able to use the live chat. I have Katya Gosman, who is uh, at the moment an undergraduate at UChicago, but will very soon be a graduate of UChicago. Uh, so we have a professional astrophysicist on the line. So if you have any questions and I happen not to see the live chat, uh, she will be answering all of those questions uh, most likely better than even I could. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to throw those out there. She will get to them as soon as she sees them. But with that, we are going to just go ahead and jump right in. So as you can see behind me is kind of uh, just a simple day sky. We're out in the middle of a field. You can see the sun. Nothing too exciting going on here. But as you can turn around, you can kind of look around and see where all the directions are. One of the nice things about Stellarium is you can turn it on so you have directions and know what uh, way you're looking into the sky. Now obviously at night, you're not going to have that to help you figure out which way you're looking. So the first thing I always want to show people is how to find your way around the night sky uh, without a compass and without, with very little knowledge of the actual night sky. And the best thing about being in Wisconsin is that we have a very useful tool in the night sky all year round. But to start, first thing we're going to have to do is move time forward. So we're going to keep going a little bit farther actually. We're going to stop at about 9.30. That's about when the sky is nice and dark. All of the extra sunlight has kind of left our atmosphere and we're left with a beautiful night sky where you can see all sorts of stars and all of this beautiful view. So we're going to zoom out a little bit, get kind of a more wide view of the night sky before we zoom in on specific things. Another nice thing about Stellarium is it labels all of the really bright stars for you. Uh, so some of the brightest stars in the sky, you can kind of see a group 
of four of them plus a planet uh, over to the west. So tonight in the west at 930, you'll actually be able to go out and the brightest thing in the sky that you'll see is what will look like a very bright, bright star. In reality, that bright star is actually the planet Venus. And Venus will be brighter than any of those other stars in that area. It just so happens that Venus tonight is in an area that is full of bright stars. You have Betelgeuse, which is a bright red star, and has, has been in the news quite a bit recently, as it was dimming quite a lot, and uh, people were not exactly sure why. Uh, and don't worry, I won't say the name anymore, so we don't have to worry. Up above that, you can see the star Capella. Now, Capella is also a very bright star that you'll be able to pick out very clearly. For Scion, and then Sirius, which actually happens to be the brightest star in our night sky. But we're not going to be too concerned about these stars at the moment. What we want to do is turn around, and we want to face north. But as I mentioned earlier, you're not always going to have those uh, nice red letters in the sky to tell you what direction you're facing. So you kind of have to look for a specific pattern and be able to pick that out on your own. And the pattern that I recommend everybody looks for is the one that we're all hopefully quite familiar with. And as I zoom in a little bit farther, you can see some star names are popping up now. And if that shape looks familiar to you, uh, you've probably picked it out in the night sky before, and that is the Big Dipper. Now, the reason the Big Dipper is really nice to look for is because, for one, it's always in our night sky. It's not always in the same spot in the night sky, and we'll go into that in a little bit and talk about why that is. But you, uh, because we're in Wisconsin, we can always find the Big Dipper and the Big Dipper is also nice because there are uh, six of those seven stars are actually fairly bright stars. So even in light polluted areas, you can still pick out the Big Dipper quite easily. So with the Big Dipper, you start at the tip of the handle here in al -Qaid, go down to Mizar, Alioth, and down through the other ones all the way until you have the full cup. Now, one thing I have to mention is that the Big Dipper, while many people think is probably one of the most well-known constellations, is actually not a constellation at all. The Big Dipper is what's called an asterism, meaning it's part of a larger constellation that looks like something completely different. So while we look up and we see those seven stars representing a spoon, in reality, it's actually the back end of the bear Ursa Major. So as we zoom out a little bit, you can see that we have a bear there. He's upside down right now. And that bear's name is Ursa Major. So if you're not quite up to date, up to date on your Latin, it just means big bear. That's all. And so Ursa Major is one of the first things that you want to find mainly the Dipper because the other stars in Ursa Major are not that bright and, can, and are usually much harder to pick out than the seven stars that make up the Dipper. Now, the reason that you want to find the Big Dipper is because you can use it to find another very important star. So if you take Merak and Dupe, and these are the two stars that are on the side of the cup on the opposite side of the handle. And if you draw a line between them, and you continue that line down, you can see that you'll hit another star named Polaris. Now, if you don't know the star Polaris, you might know it better by a different name, the North Star. And Polaris is great because it's always in that exact same spot throughout the entire night. You can always count on going there and finding Polaris in that same spot Another great thing is Polaris is also the tip of the handle of the Little Dipper, and as you may have guessed and has already shown up here, uh, if the Big Dipper is part of a Big Bear, it only makes sense that the Little Dipper is part of the Little Bear or Ursa Minor. 
Now, one thing you might notice is that these two bears look a little funny. And the reason they might look a little funny is because they have very long tails for normal bears. But according to how these bears got into the sky, the tails actually make a little bit of sense. So in the Greek mythology, it was actually Zeus who grabbed these two bears by the tail, swung them around over his head, and he swung them so hard and so fast that it stretched their tails out, and when he let go, they went flying and got stuck up in the sky and have stayed there ever since. And so to this day, these two bears have very long tails and have always stuck in those two same parts of the sky. Now, not every culture had uh, this exact same story. Uh, some cultures, especially in the UK, the Big Dipper is actually represented as a plow. Uh, Ursa Major is also sometimes seen as the government in ancient Chinese uh, astronomy. But there are also many Native American tribes that look up and uh, recognize these two constellations having to do uh, either representing bears or stories related to bears. So two different cultures have the exact same constellations representing very similar figures in the sky. Now, in uh, one of the most common Native American stories, the three stars in the handle are actually hunters chasing the bear, so those bears don't have extremely long tails. But still, these constellations both represent bears in those cultures along with the Greek mythology. Now, these are the two constellations that most people can go out and find. Uh, I do want to mention Ursa Minor, or the Little Dipper, is actually not that easy of a constellation to pick out at night, as it is not one of the brighter constellations up there. Polaris, uh, being the North Star, many people tend to think it is the brightest star in the sky, and so when you go out, you look for the brightest one out there, and then you know you're facing north. More often than not, if you go outside and you look for the brightest star in the sky, you'll end up facing south, and most likely facing a planet. So don't go out and look for the brightest star thinking you're facing north. You will almost never be right. Because Polaris is about the 47th or 48th brightest star in the entire night sky. And now that's referring to every star we can see in the sky throughout the year. Uh, so it's never really the 47th brightest star in the sky at any one moment. But it's still not a very bright star in its own right. So using the Big Dipper to find it is actually very, very helpful and allows you uh, to be sure that you're looking at the correct one. And then if you just so happen to have a dark enough sky, you can look a little closer to see if you can find Ursa Minor. Now there's one more constellation that I want to point out. Oh, and as you can see, because I clicked on Capella earlier, uh, Orija is now up. That's the constellation that Capella represents the goat, and as Orija was a goat herder. But I want to look down a little bit, and if you look down, you might notice that there's almost kind of a W shape. And there we have Cassiopeia. So we're going to zoom in on Cassiopeia and I'm going to take the picture away. Because we just want to look at the lines at the moment. And Cassiopeia is, a very, is another very useful constellation because just like the Big Dipper, it is always in our night sky. And just like the Big Dipper, you can almost use it to find Polaris. So if you look at the way the W, uh, where the W opens up, it actually opens up towards uh, Ursa Minor and Polaris. Now there are no two good stars that really line up as nicely as the two in the cup of the Big Dipper. So Cassiopeia isn't as useful but you can still use it to get an idea of which direction to move your eyes. Another nice thing about Cassiopeia is if I zoom out a little bit farther, you can notice that the center of the Big Dipper, right there, and then you have Polaris, and then here in Cassiopeia, you can see that Cassiopeia is on the exact opposite side of Polaris from Ursa Major. So if you find Cassiopeia, you can use the opening of the W 
uh, to look and try to find Polaris. And if you can't find that, just keep going a little bit farther and you'll find the Big Dipper and you can use that to find Polaris. Now we want to talk a little bit about some other constellations in our sky. Oh, actually, I take that back. Uh, one thing we're going to do first is we are going to talk about one of the, or I should say two of the stars in the Big Dipper. Now, if you look at the middle star of the handle of the Big Dipper, you might be able to see that there are actually two stars there. So one of those stars named is Alcor. The other one is Mizar. And if we zoom in on them, the closer we get, the more obvious it becomes that there are actually two stars there. And now this is a visual binary, meaning that uh, from uh, where they are in space, they look like they're right next to each other, uh, but really, they don't interact. And so as we zoom back out, you can see that the distance between them gets smaller and smaller. And if you go outside at night, you should actually be able to look up there and distinguish uh, the, that there are two separate stars there. Now, the old story is that the ancient Romans, in order to determine who was allowed to be an archer in the Roman military, you had to be able, with the naked eye, distinguish that Mizar and Alcor are two separate stars. Now, the reality is, is you don't have to have special eyes in order to tell that those are two stars there. Uh, it was more of a test just to make sure anybody like me, with, that, with, that if I did not have my glasses, I would not be able to see that those two stars are not just one big glowing blob. So I would not have been a good Roman archer without my glasses. So when you go outside at night and you find the handle of the Big Dipper, you can look up, find Mizar and Alcor, and see if you would make it in the Roman uh, archery unit. Now we are going to take a little stroll elsewhere into the sky. And what I want to point out is that uh, we use the Big Dipper in order to find Polaris. So we took the right two stars, uh, Dupe and uh, Merak. Now there's actually another trick you can use. And this one is called the Arc to Arcturus. So if you look at the handle of the Big Dipper, and you follow those kind of along that arc and you extend it along, you can see that you hit a star named Arcturus. Now Arcturus is a, another very bright star in the constellation Boötes, and Boötes was a herdsman. Uh, also, if I take the drawing away there, uh, there's another famous asterism here. Uh, just as the Big Dipper is hidden in Ursa Major, there's also an asterism hidden here in Boötes. If you t kind of look at where Arcturus is, along with this star and this one, and you kind of imagine that being an ice cream cone, you can look up at the rest of this being a big scoop of ice cream. And the nice thing about Boatees is it's up during the summer, so how fitting that we have a nice big ice cream cone in the summer to cool us down at night. Now we're going to zoom back out a little bit, because we want to kind of have more of a view of everything that's going up in the night sky. So these are some of the main constellations that you can look for in the north, especially during the summer. Now, I want to point out some constellations that are getting a little lower in the sky. Some more famous than others, but down over here to the south, getting just below the horizon where the, our tree line here is actually blocking it, is Orion. And so we can't see the belt of Orion because of the tree line, but if we really wanted to, the cool thing about Stellarium is that we can just tell the ground to go away and we can look at whatever we want, basically whenever we want. 
So there we have the belt. You have the left shoulder Bellatrix, the right shoulder Beetlejuice, and the bottom left foot is a very bright star named Rigel. Now it's one of the better ones to look for in the winter, as now, as you can see, by 9.30, it's already a little too late to go and look for it. But most people tend to ask me, where is Orion? Uh, unfortunately, most of those people tend to ask me when I'm outside during the summer, and so I have to disappointingly tell them that it's uh, hidden by the Earth. It's just on the other side, and the sun's in the way. So we're going to stick to constellations a little bit higher up, and I want to talk quick, tell a quick story about one of my favorite constellations that's currently in the sky. And that constellation's name is Cancer. Now, if you've heard of Cancer, you've probably heard of it in relation to the zodiac, and we can talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but Cancer is also another very old constellation that uh, was talked about by the uh, ancient Greeks. And I'm going to put the art on so you can see that uh, Cancer is a crab. Um, not many people realize that there's actually a big crab up in the sky. And the better part is not many people know why there's a giant crab up in the sky. So just as the two bears got thrown up into the sky by Zeus, this crab was also thrown up into the sky. But this crab was thrown up into the sky for a bit of a different reason. In Greek mythology, while Hercules, uh, the ancient Greek hero, was fighting Hydra, the multi-headed dragon, uh, he stepped a little too close to an innocent crab that was just minding its own business. He scared the crab, so the crab pinched him on the foot to warn him not to step on him. Well, Zeus's wife Hera, who did not like Hercules very much, thought that this was so funny, she wanted to immortalize that crab forever, and so she took that crab and threw it up into the night sky, where it has remained ever since, and so we are left now with Cancer the Crab, simply because he pinched Hercules on the foot, and it was very, very funny. Now zooming back up, you can see our sky is starting to get a little bit more full, and I want to talk about um, sometimes it can be tricky to find certain constellations. One constellation that's actually quite easy to find has to deal with this star, Regulus. So if you look at Regulus and go up a little bit to uh, this star here, all the way over here, and you kind of keep going along this line, you kind of end up with the shape of a backwards question mark. And this backwards question mark, as you can see, is the head and the mane of Leo the Lion. Now, for any Harry Potter fans out there, like myself, uh, you'll notice uh, Regulus was the name of one of the characters in Harry Potter's brother. And his brother was Sirius, who happens to be down over there on the horizon. And next to Beetlejuice in Orion was the star Bellatrix. And so that entire family from Harry Potter are actually named after different stars in our night sky. So we're going to zoom out a little bit again. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, one more const two more constellations, actually. So over here we have Coma Berenices. Now Coma Berenices is kind of an odd constellation in that, as you can see, it is just a lock of hair up in the sky. But it also happens to be the only constellation in the entire night sky that's named after somebody we know existed, as Coma Berenices was actually an ancient Egyptian princess. And the story goes that when her father and her kingdom went off to war, uh, she begged to the gods to return her father safely from that war, and as a sacrifice, she gave them her hair, which was said to be the most beautiful hair in the entire world, and the gods accepted that sacrifice and put it up into the night sky forever. 
And so we know that Coma Berenices, this constellation today, is one of the only ones, is the only one named after somebody we know for a fact existed. And the last constellation that I want to talk about is just kind of a fun one. Because not many people are aware that there's actually a unicorn up in the sky named Monoceros. Uh, not the most obvious name for a unicorn, but hiding right behind Orion, we have the unicorn Monoceros. So now we have talked about quite a few of the constellations that are up in our sky tonight, that at 9.30 you could go out and find most of these, and there are a lot of very useful apps that you can download on your phone, some that are free that are very, very good, so don't bother paying for one unless you want to control a telescope. There are some really good free ones out there if you just explore a little bit and find one that works for you. So I'm going to turn uh, some of these constellations off. And we're gonna look at the sky a little more broadly. And we're gonna turn back and find Polaris. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Polaris stays in the same spot for the entire night and actually for the entire day. And the really cool thing about Stellarium is that we can actually show that here to you right now. So I'm actually going to turn constellations back on because it's helpful to see where those constellations are around it. And so here we have Polaris. And we're going to zoom out a little bit so you can see a little more of the night sky. And down here at the bottom, one of the settings we're going to change is we're going to turn the atmosphere off. Now if you notice, when I did that, the difference in the night sky. We can actually see quite a bit more now. And the stars, especially the ones near the horizon, stick out more. And the reason we're doing this is because as I fast forward through time, uh, normally when the sun comes up, everything that we want to look at disappears. And we don't want that. We want to be able to watch it, uh, even if the sun is up in the sky. Uh, so now without any atmosphere, when the sun comes up, it's just going to be a really bright star and we'll still be able to see all of the rest of the stars. So now we're going to start moving time forward. And if you watch, we have the Big Dipper up here and we have Cassiopeia down here. And we're going to just speed up a little bit. Oh didn't quite hit it. There it is. So as you can see, Cassiopeia and the Big Dipper stay in the same spots relative to each other, and they just move around Polaris. So now in astronomy, we actually look at kind of the sky in this kind of uh, interesting grid system. And it all starts with that point where Polaris is. And if I take that little highlight off, you can see that Polaris is actually not quite at the center of that point. Oh, and now you can see that the sun is up in the sky as our, uh, the ground around us is now lit up, but we can still see the stars because there's no atmosphere. But Polaris is so close to that point where everything revolves around, it looks as though Polaris does not move at all in our night sky. And even though it does move slightly, uh, from what we can see and how fast the sky moves to our naked eye, it's almost uh, not noticeable. Now if you're wondering, this grid system goes by right ascension and declination. Now, those terms might uh, mean absolutely nothing, and that's perfectly fine. They're not really used outside of astronomy, but as you go up these lines and toward Polaris, that is a, uh, you're changing your declination. If you're going along these lines, but staying the same distance away from Polaris, you're changing in your right ascension. Now, one thing as we kind of move along, 
going a little faster, you can see that here now we have the sun up in the sky and the planet Mercury. And if we go back a little bit, you can see Mars, Saturn, and Jupiter are also in a line. And so now we can watch as everything... Oh, wrong one. There we go. Stay in the same places as they spin around. Now, a really cool thing that you can do, as long as you're not nervous about seven about uh, seven years of bad luck, if you take an umbrella and you hold it over your shoulder, the point of the umbrella is very similar to pointing towards Polaris. And if you spin that umbrella, you can kind of see how the inside lines of the umbrella also move just like our night sky. So it's a really cool way to demonstrate, even for yourself, how the night sky moves. Now, one last thing that I want to talk about a little bit are uh, I mentioned that there are some things hidden in the night sky in the description to this video. Tonight, we will also be doing a very similar show where I will talk about some of the same constellations and a little bit about how all of this moves. But on top of that, we're also going to be looking at certain objects in our night sky. One of those objects being, uh, most of those objects will be galaxies. So if you're not familiar, a galaxy is a very large group of stars outside of our galaxy, so millions and millions of light years away. If you've heard of the Milky Way galaxy, that is the big group of stars that our sun belongs to, and there are a bunch of galaxies out there, and some of them look really, really cool. So one of the galaxies that we'll actually be taking live images of is this one, the Whirlpool Galaxy. So as we zoom in closer and closer, you can see here that this is a giant spiral galaxy, and you can see the big spiral arms swirling out from the center, and off to up and to the right, is a smaller galaxy which actually orbits around that larger galaxy because at some point in uh, millions of years ago it got a little bit too close and so it captured with it with its gravity and it actually will pass through that galaxy multiple times and so that is the whirlpool galaxy there's also a couple other galaxies that we'll be looking at oh one of them being Bode's Galaxy. So this is another very famous one, M81, and it also just happens to be next to another very famous galaxy, which is M82, or the Cigar Galaxy, which is a very similar galaxy, except it's oriented, so we're only looking at the side of it. So instead of kind of looking a top-down view, like we are with uh, M81 or Bode's Galaxy, we're essentially looking at it just from edge on. So as you can see, the galaxies are actually pretty flat. Uh, they are very, very wide. And unfortunately, this one isn't the most clear, but there's also another really good galaxy called the Sombrero Galaxy, which I have to turn the ground off to see. And we can zoom in, and you can see a great example of looking at a galaxy edge on. And so these are some of the galaxies that we'll actually be able to use a telescope to take images of if you join uh, us tonight. Now I'm going to go look into the chat, uh, but otherwise I want to thank all of you guys for tuning in. Uh, if you can let us know how we did. We're very happy that we were able to at least offer something to any of you that were uh, really had, had your hopes up for the tech savvy activities. We really wanted to be there with the planetarium. 
So we hope we were able to at least give you a taste of what you could have seen had we been able to be there uh, back in March. But with that, I'm going to end the stream and I hope to see you guys tonight. And if you can't stay up until 11 p.m. tonight, the video will actually be on YouTube tomorrow so you can still uh, see how much fun we had we had tonight, tomorrow. But with that, thank you guys all for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your day and have a great weekend.